Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Picard. I'm the Executive Director of Peerless Rockville, and I'm very happy to welcome you all here this evening to our event, Stories of Desegregation. Uh, I, don't, I, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience today, and I'm really thrilled about that, and I'm also delighted to see some that I don't recognize as well. And um, I will say that tonight's event is the final one in a series we have been doing. We started it in February, and this is in partnership with many organizations and individuals. And we have, it's been a great success. The series has been Emancipation to Integration and it has been looking at the history of um, efforts to educate the African American population here in Rockville and Montgomery County and the struggle to bring equality to those students. And we really started with a look at emancipation and uh, we had a talk at the Rockville Library by, with someone who studied that period and what it was really like, just to bring some context to the story, um, to really start the struggle. We also have an exhibit that still is at the library, and this exhibit actually celebrates the 150th anniversary of a petition by 20 um, Rockville County um, black men to support a school and a teacher so that their um, the students and young people and even older people in the community could learn to read and become educated to better themselves in the community. That exhibit is still in the library and if you haven't seen it, please stop by at the Rockville Library right here in Town Center. Um, from there we looked at the first years of efforts to educate this population. At that time there were only primary schools and they were scattered in rural locations throughout the county and um, they were also often held in churches. So that event was actually in Jerusal Jerusalem Methodist Church here in Rockville. It was a lovely event. We thank that congregation and Ralph Buglis, who's here tonight, who was our speaker, as well as Reverend Jane Wood, who helped with that event. Um, we went on to have an event on the story of Williams, William Gibbs, who was a principal at Rockville Colored Elementary School who brought a case against the school board um, and had a very young Thurgood Marshall as his legal representative. And that was a, the very first legal win for teacher pay equality um, and a very interesting story for Rockville that happened right here in the Gray Courthouse. Uh, we've continued to go on and tell the story with a program at Carver High School where we had a panel that was two weeks ago and we had a panel event that night of alumni sharing their stories for a link actually Lincoln High School and Carver alumni sharing their stories so tonight we wrap up our series with the actual look on what happened during the desegregation process and to start that we are very fortunate to have gotten permission from Montgomery County television to replay um, a, a desegregation vi video that was made for Paths to the Present, which is a series that's they've done some historical um, documentaries. This actually has a lot of interviews of people with firsthand accounts. So we're going to start with that, kind of get everyone thinking a little bit about what it was like during that time period. And after that, we will um, be treated to a panel of um, individuals who can share their firsthand accounts. So we are going to get started. I see some more people coming in. Um, I just also want to say if you don't know about Peerless Rockville, please um, stop me afterwards, stop one of my staff. Uh, Miriam you know, know is my education and outreach manager. Kathy Rogers may still be outside. She's our collections manager. We are um, right in the Red Brook Courthouse. We have office hours and we have a research library and archival documents and we have many educational programs throughout the year. You have probably seen we were handing out a, a flyer for our speaker series that's coming up with Glenview Mansion and that will start in June and continue throughout the next year. So. Um, I think that's all of a pitch for that right now, and we will move on. And oh, and thank you very much to the city and to Channel 11, who is filming for us this evening. Thank you. In 
1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on that now famous case of Brown versus the Board of Education. In that ruling, a unanimous court stated that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. In 1955, they added that all schools must be desegregated with deliberate speed. When the Supreme Court decision was handed down in 1954, Montgomery County, like other jurisdictions, had to plan for integration. Rose Kramer was on the county's Board of Education at the time. She remembers her reaction to the Supreme Court decision like it was yesterday. Well, I was elated because by that time I was so aware of how uneven our school system was in Montgomery County. Uh, how so inferior our black schools as a whole were in relation to the white schools, how truly segregated we were, and that even the white and black teachers didn't participate in many of the things that were to better teachers. How did the rest of the school board react? I think either indifferent or uh, hoping that it would go away. Uh, not all. There was no effort on their part to say, oh, this is an opportunity. And uh, rather surprised me, very honestly, because I thought in my own mind this was a great opportunity, both to, for the good of the children and for the same, from the standpoint of the whole physical plant of the, of the schools of Montgomery County. How did MCPS move from resisting desegregation to implementing desegregation? Not easily. <laughs> the interesting thing was that when I as a leader in this on the school board kept persisting, when are we going to get to this, we did the usual thing of having a study commission. That took a year. The study commission came up with it doesn't look like a problem. Remember Montgomery County only had 7% blacks in the whole county. The school board said, well, let's have kindergarten integrated, and then we'll study it a year. We'll do it for a year, and then we'll study it for a year. So I, trying to make them look ridiculous, said that means it will take us 24 years to desegregate the Montgomery County school system, which did make them look a little foolish. And so we then began doing several grades at a time with the always my parting them with the law says. Mm -hmm. The law says you must do this. The advisory committee created to study integration issues was made up of leaders in the white and African American communities. They poured over countless letters and heard hours of testimony on the subject. There were people who wanted to proceed, but most were wary of this thing that had never been done before. Others were against the idea altogether. They accumulated people on their side who talked about social engineering. We were doing social engineering, right? and I remember that expression. Uh, and that uh, time would take care of these things and that we mustn't go, you know, all the usual, because they couldn't deny the law was on our side. By the way, there were such things as threats, midnight calls in my house. Uh, how dare you do this? You're the leader, you're the troublemaker. But uh, that's really what leadership is all about. You, you, when you are sure that what you're attempting to achieve has backing of other people, is right, uh, it, it really, you can take it, you know. Public school integration in Montgomery County began at the start of the 1955-56 school year. It is said that the process went smoothly, and compared to school districts in other parts of the country, this is true. It wasn't, however, a transition without challenges. The first step began in the 55-56 school year. At that time, five African-American teachers were transferred out of substandard schools to all white schools. One of those teachers was Allison Claggett, who describes how they prepared. We had uh, committees. We met. We met with the superintendent. We met with the different, uh, uh, we call them integration committees. And we would discuss different methods of working with kids and working with parents. And uh, people would ask me, he said, Allison, how would, how, do you mind teaching 
white kids. And my answer was, it doesn't make any difference to me. I like to teach kids that I love children. And all I need for them to do is to come to school with an attitude that they want to learn. And they will be taught. As plans were made to close the Down County Colored Schools, parents at Rollingwood Elementary expressed the most vocal opposition. Some of them said behind the scenes they didn't want their children to go to school with their maid's children. And uh, they weren't going to have it. And oh, they said many, many mean things uh, in those letters. As the 56-57 school year began, up county schools were included in the integration plan. There, African Americans could request that their children be transferred to certain schools. George Barnes was one of the children whose transfer was approved. On September 4, 1956, he arrived for his first day. First day at Poolsville Junior Senior High School uh, is, is memorable, stay in my mind forever, um, very vividly. Uh, I arrived at school. Um, on a bus that picked me up. Uh, my parents put me on the bus and then they followed in a the car. There was a police officer on the bus. Uh, police officer there, I guess for my safety, since I was the only African American on the bus. So the police officer rode the bus, I got to school. Got with some other kids who came from other areas here around Poosville, Jerusalem, um, uh, Big Woods Road. And uh, we got together, the front door well, there was a mob of, I'll see a mob of people, you would say mass or congregation and other, other situations. This was, a, this was a mob. And they were there to bar um, the black students from entering school and registering as a student. A gentleman who had come to Poolsville as principal at the time, a, a guy named Crawford, Mr. Crawford, um, got together with the parents and uh, the students outside the, the area and it was away from the crowd and said, well, you know, come with me. I mean, we're going to go around to the back of the school, and we're going to come in that way, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was through the back entrance we came in and registered and, and started school. Uh, that was the first day. One of the teachers at Poolsville that same year was Representative Connie Morella. She recalls the racial tension vividly. Not only did the African-American students have to put up with the protest, but I'm sure it was no fun having lunch in the cafeteria because this is where the students, particularly the older students, would band together, sit together, and make, make remarks. Make remarks sometimes just to be part of the, the crowd, to be, you know, vulgish kind of thing where we can't possibly show that we would like to sit with them or we think they're nice people. So the students had to put up with notes being passed to them too where they were insulted. They had to put up with papers that I read, and I'm sure that they saw or heard about, which indicated that they were inferior, that they should not be together with the, uh, uh, with the white students. The hostility wasn't limited to inside of school. Every night for about a week and a half, two weeks, uh, there were just a multitude of the line of cars, a parade that came past my home, they, and they, people threw trash, um, uh, all types of things, uh, fecal matter from animals and what that in the yard, I remember those things distinctly, cleaning up the yard in the morning before I went to school. Bobby Israel also began at an integrated school in 56. He entered fifth grade at West Rockville, which is today Bell Elementary. Initially, I really didn't make any friends, but the mayor of Rockville at that time was a man named Alexander Green, and his son became my first friend. And by the end of the school year, uh, I made friends that uh, I just saw at our 35th the high school reunion recently, and we're still friends. But uh, there were many, many fights, many, many kids who didn't really want to touch us. There were days in the two years that I attended here that uh, I remember once about 30 white kids chasing a friend of ours right down this street to my house, which is right on North Washington Street. Uh, we were called all sorts of names. Uh, so. Although I did make some friends, there are probably some children that didn't want me there then, and uh, we're still not friends until this day. Bobby Israel graduated from Richard Montgomery in 1965. You really have to keep in mind that uh, the neighborhoods were still segregated, so 
there really wasn't that much opportunity for us to play after school unless you traveled to somebody's house. So uh, integration in school was fine into high school. The sports teams were integrated and all that sort of thing. But uh, social integration was not there by 1965. Not everyone was hostile. In fact, most weren't. Bill Thomas was a junior when integration came to Sherwood High School in 1957. I wondered what was going to happen. I wondered whether there would be any kind of uh, rebellion on the part of the white students. Uh, to the best of my recollection, there was none of any significance. The fact that our opinion or our feelings about black children were different uh, was something that it was very important that when we as students began to realize that these kids were just like us, at least that's my sense, is that they were students, they were my age, they were my gender, uh, the, the feelings that I had, and I may be oversimplifying it, I'll be honest, but it, to the best of my recollection, it was, it was good. Here at Gaithersburg High School, integration began in 58 when John McGraw was a senior. I would describe my own feeling as one of being curious uh, because I had very little um, relationship with African Americans, so I was curious to see how it goes. I made friends there in the small group of uh, African Americans uh, that we had. I became pretty good friends with uh, a student named Tom Prather, and we, we had classes uh, together and I don't think I really realized it at, at the time but uh, I, it certainly increased my awareness of how other people lived and uh, how black Americans were living. Some African American students had an easier time. Friends since childhood Anita Summerhour and Rentha Butler moved to Broome Junior High in 1958. They credit their elementary teacher at Rock Terrace for the easy transition. We had the same teacher in the fifth and sixth grades, Gladys Boston, yeah. and she prepared us for it. And she prepared us for it because she talked to the children that had gone to integrated schools before we had and about the problems they had, any problems that they had. And from the problems that they had, she knew what she had to do with us. And she did it in two years. We were well prepared when we came into an integrated school. I thought it was scary just going from elementary to junior high. Well, if you remember, though, a lot of us were separated. We didn't see each other until gym mm -hmm. or, or, ca or lunch because the ones that were really pretty bright, I'm not saying I was all that bright, they kept us separated. Like I had English by myself. I had geography by myself. I may have had math or something with you, but we didn't get to see each other until gym. Now, what settled my nerves was I, I met a girl in class, and she was very nice to me, so I kind of relaxed, but it was very scary not seeing your friends all day, mm -hmm. I mean, except twice. There were probably some white kids that were just as afraid as we were. True. And, I, you know, maybe we were drawn to each other. In the end, the school board maintained that integration would proceed, but sometimes it was not without a fight. One morning when I went in class, uh, the other African-American student who was in class with me, and we supported each other, uh, didn't come to school that day. So I was left alone in the class. The students, uh, several of which were pretty big guys, uh, proceeded to lock the teacher in the closet. They locked the teacher in the closet and came over to me and said, now you're going to get what you've been, been asking for. Okay? Um, I decided this day that I really felt for my, uh, feared for my life and I felt that if I didn't fight back to the best of my ability that I was going to be in real trouble. So the guy came over to me and pushed me and, it, and I fell out of the desk, he turned the desk over. When I got up, we tussled for a little bit, and I don't know what, I, I didn't hit him with anything. I hit the guy, and he went down, and I just went on him, and you know, when I, somebody pulled me off of him, um, uh, the, some people came in and you know, took over the class and got everybody settled, what have you. But that guy, and I remember his name, but that's not important, he never returned to school, and I think that was a turning point for us. Um, I don't relish the fact that I had to do this, and I don't believe that if you talk about character building that this was an integral part, uh, but I think it was absolutely necessary. If I had to do it again, I don't know. Um, I think if the people today had an opportunity to go back and change things and, and be a little more accommodating from 1956, they probably would, because I don't think that they would want this type of legacy. 
By 1961, Montgomery County Public Schools were considered fully integrated. All children went to their neighborhood schools. Not all neighborhoods were integrated, neither were all schools. The way MCPS addressed this was to assign one African American teacher to each of the remaining all-white schools. But the effort to address racial balance didn't stop there. Councilmember Blair Ewing served on the school board from 1976 to 1998. He believes that's when the real challenges began. From the time of the uh, Brown decision until the mid-70s, the impact on Montgomery County of desegregation was very real, and it came rather slowly, but it wasn't major because the uh, proportion of the population that was African American and other minorities totaled only 12% of the student population in the county. But things began to change in the late, uh, late 60s, early 70s, when uh, one school in particular, Rosemary Hills Elementary, became uh, a majority African American school. And that was of concern to people of goodwill because they felt that that was resegregation and that we ought to take steps to, to uh, see what we could do to remedy that uh, situation there. A busing program was implemented to better integrate county schools. Later, magnet programs were instituted to draw students and achieve racial balance in ethnically diverse areas. And a transfer policy was adopted to help schools more closely reflect their community which was recently overturned. One doesn't want to deliberately create schools that have that concentration of one, one group, one class. Uh, that, it seems to me, is an unfortunate result of, of, of housing patterns when that occurs. And uh, it has occurred in some schools. But on the whole, the board's efforts, I think, have, have had a degree of success in maintaining uh, racially and ethnically uh, diverse neighborhoods that are more integrated than many in the, ca in the country as a whole and more successful in that regard than many. Now at the beginning of the 21st century, enrollment in the county's public schools is reported to be less than 50 percent white. While this is a dramatic change from the days of segregation, there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, obviously, things are a world of, of betterment or a world of improvement. Is, are there things to do? Absolutely. And the thing that is, I think, the, the biggest reality is to know that there's still some folks that are unhappy. Black children don't appreciate what went on before they came. You know, they take education for granted. We did not. Um, they don't understand what, what we had to go through. Not us so much, but our forefathers to even get to this point. They just take it for granted. It's no big deal to them. They don't want to read, they don't want to know the history, they don't want to know anything. And it's not just them, it's the white kids too. Mm -hmm. The cultures have intermixed and the worst of each culture, everybody has embraced. Once we get to the point where all students are able to be equipped with all the equipment and uh, when we get parents, black or white, to really have a divested interest in the kid. That's when the whole educational system, I think, will improve. School can't do it all. We've got to have a, a, a community thing. It takes a community to take care of a child or to educate him or do anything else with, that he has to have. It takes the whole community. So uh, we've got to get big business and all of their expertise. And everybody got to get their heads together. We've got to get these children up where they belong. What I really think needs to be done is that the whole concept of race, period, needs to be done away with. Uh, as long as we identify ourselves by race instead of just, just humans, period, I think you're always going to have problems. So, uh, sorry. So obviously that was shot in 2000. So it is a little out of date now, but I thought that we thought that some of the sentiments and the people that we heard from 
that aren't around with us today, some of them to share their stories, that it was definitely beneficial to share again with all of you. Um, very interesting to look at how, how diverse the population is now in so many different ways. Um, it's become probably much less straightforward black and white than it was in the past, but it is great to do this exercise to, remember, to remind people of where we have come from, and that's what we've tried to do. I do want to know before we move on, you saw Nina Clark in there, looking fabulous, of course. Um, we used a couple resources, many resources for our series, but two of the ones that we really um, counted on a lot were two books. This one, Before Us Lies the Timber by Warwick Hill, and um, The History of Black Public Schools of Montgomery County, Maryland by Nina Clark and Lillian Brown. We have them both at the Peerless Library. If anyone has not read them but would like to see them, please come by and visit us sometime to do that. So as we continue, um, I am going to ask, I will introduce our moderator for this evening. We are very lucky to have with us Ambassador and U.S. Congresswoman Connie Morella. Uh, I will introduce her now, and then after that, if our panelists can come forward and just remember as you um, answer questions, we will be passing a portable microphone, so if you could just wait to speak until you have the microphone in front of you, that would be wonderful. So a little bit about Connie. We're very fortunate to have her here this evening, and you saw her on the video as well. Uh, she served as U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, in Paris from 2003 to 2007. She's the first U.S. Ambassador to the OECD ever to have served in the U.S. Congress. From 1987 until 2003, Ambassador Morella represented Maryland's 8th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, where she developed a national reputation as a leading advocate for women, children, and families as well as a promoter of economic growth through science and technology. Prior to the U.S. Congress, Ambassador Morella served in the Maryland Gen General Assembly for eight years. Morella was appointed by President Obama to the, ba the American Battle Monuments Commission, which is the guardian of our American cemeteries overseas. She is also ambassador in residence at American University in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Morella earned an Associate of Arts in 1950 and a Bachelor of Arts from Boston University in 1954. She became a secondary school teacher in the Montgomery County, Maryland public school system in 1957, where she first taught at Poolsville, in Poolsville. Um, she stayed in the county system till 1961 and then went on to American University, where she earned an MA in 1967 and was an instructor there before becoming a professor at Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland. She continued to teach until 1985, and we are very delighted to have her here with us tonight to share her own stories of desegregation with all of yours. Connie? You. So if you could come up. So if any panelists could take a minute and please come up to these lovely seats. Um, you know who you are, so we'll give you a minute to please do that. And we'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself too appropriately. So if you take your time up. Thank you very much for the introduction, Thank Nancy. You. That reminded me of something that was attributed to Mae West. Do you remember that name from the old, no. old, old movies? Where she said, uh, too much of a good thing can be downright enjoyable. So thank you for that lengthy introduction. And so I've got to tell you, since we're talking about integration and the way it was and the way we want it to be, one of the things I, d I was able to do as uh, your representative was introduce the legislation that brought about the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Now, the way that was done was really because I represented a group of the uh, Alpha Phi Alphas who were part of the fraternity that Martin Luther King belonged to, who then brought it to my attention that here we've got somebody who is for integration, civil rights, human rights, peacefully, and we do not have anything to remind our young people who come through Washington of, of the heritage and what it signifies. So at any rate, enough of that. As I came here, somebody said to me, has anyone told you that you look like Connie Morella? 
And I said, yeah, but she's older than I am. But I don't know. I can't get away with that. <laughs> so and and uh, so therefore, what I thought I would do to start off, we're going we're going to have commentary from people. I'll ask a few questions as moderator, and then I definitely want to give you an opportunity to make comments or ask any questions you may have, because this is for you. I do also want to put in kudos for Peerless Rockville. I am a member, my husband is a member, and they do truly believe in preserving our heritage. And that's something that's very important uh, to happen. And I want to thank Miriam and Nancy and the team that helped to put it together. And I particularly want to thank you for coming. You know, it's not easy on a Tuesday night to get in that car and to get on over to the mayor and a council's office to listen to some history even though it's very important history. So what I thought I would do, since we have some incredible panelists, I want to hear from them. You want to hear from them. I thought I would let them introduce themselves. But in the interest of time, and because I want to pose some questions, I am going to yield to them, each of them, 40 seconds. Uh, and. Um, I do want them to also include, when they give any commentary, that they would like to let you know who they are, include a fun fact. By that I mean <clears throat> something about themselves that nobody knows. And that might be interesting for us to know a little bit more about you. So maybe I will, uh, I usually vote to the left, but I think I'll start on the right. And so if you'd introduce yourself, and there's going to be a handheld microphone, uh, we would really appreciate it. But I'm honored to be here with this panel. I've read a little bit about what they have done, and I am very impressed. So you may be up. Uh, okay, entree. first of all, in, in 40 seconds, I, I, I can do that. I'd just like to first thank uh, Ms. Connie Morella for all she did to help with integration and all of the work she did to, for people in general of all colors. I'm a, uh, my name is Mike Johnson and I was, uh, I went to Longview Elementary School where, uh, which was segregated, I went to, I was, best time of my life, I went to Carver High School for one year, mm -hmm. best time, uh, best, uh, most influential thing. And I went to Gaithersburg Middle School and then Gaithersburg High School. I guess a, a thing that, uh, of interest, especially to me, is I've been a, at, what, taught for 33 years, but I've been a sports official now for 52 years, mm. and I had never missed a game because of an injury. So I'm just feeling blessed. <laughs> Fantastic, very good. See, that's a good fact now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to thank everybody for coming. My name is Warren Crutchfield. I am a native of Rockville. I am the fifth generation of a slave family that was slaves at the Bell Dawson House. I am a teacher that came from the segregated society into a white society uh, as a teacher. I am a uh, formal, well, the way I got into it, Uncle Sam, I didn't know I had an Uncle Sam, and he drafted me into the service. And when I got out the service, they said, you have a job. Now for 18 years or 16 years, I never worked. Yeah, I worked, but never full-time job. So I had a job, so I went to Sherwood High School, and uh, it, it was it was something. And and I, when you can ask them questions about that, I can tell you some of the things that happened to me as the first Afro-American varsity uh, coach in Montgomery County, and the thing that I would tell you that uh, I was an all-American sprinter in college, and I had a chance to try out for the Olympic team, but I pulled something called hamstring, so mm -hmm. I didn't make it. They also, you have a nickname, Flash, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, good evening. Uh, we have a little bit in common as well. I grew up in Poolsville. Watching ah. George Barnes speak uh, brings back, I remember Mr. Crawford, I never met yeah. him as a principal, but when we integrated, when I integrated Poolsville Elementary School, it went from fourth grade to 12th grade. 
So he was my principal, but I was a good thing. I never had a chance to meet him. Yeah. That means I stayed on task. <laughs> uh, one thing funny about myself is I have a nickname, and they call me Spinny. I'm a motivational speaker. I travel all over mm. the country trying to educate our young children, black, white, blue, green, purple. I'm also a substitute teacher here in the county for like 27 years. But my nickname is Spinny. I'm not going to tell you how I received it. You think about it. Uh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew your nickname was Spinny, but I didn't know how you got it. Well, maybe during the Q&A we'll, we'll get to we'll that. Let somebody take some shots. <laughs> okay. Yeah. My, na <clears throat> my name is John Kelly. I came to the county in 1950. I taught at Lincoln. Uh, and then from Lincoln, I went to Western Junior High uh, off Mass Avenue. And uh, from there, I went into pupil services. Hmm. I, I don't know what was the fun fact about that. <coughs> Anything else about you you can tell us? Well, Do you have a nickname? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll call him not really. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. We will get to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is uh, Rudy Baker, and uh, I've lived in Rockville uh, mm -hmm. all my life. Uh, as a matter of fact, I lived in the west end of Rockville all my life. And uh, that fact is kind of unique in that the west end of Rockville, as you probably know, is predominantly white. Uh, and back in 1942, uh, I guess I got really started in integrating to the West End of Rockville. And how I got started was becoming friends with my next door neighbor. This is 1942. And it's, I'm very, very happy to say that that next door neighbor is here tonight. I haven't seen him in quite a number of years. We've talked occasionally during the past 50 or 60 years, but he's in the audience. His name is John Moeller, and I'd like to acknowledge Well, the next door neighbor, please raise his hand. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. John Moeller, it was so good for me to see Rudy Baker. I didn't know what to do, but uh, I'm born and raised in Rockville. I, I gave my mother the devil. Uh, she got things going for us all, but I don't know what the, I, was, I lost the word I was going to use on that. But anyhow, I've been there for a long time. And uh, he, he is an accidental. Uh, one day I'll come to the meetings or like this and show you some, tell you some good stories. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, Rudy's mom, <laughs> I don't know who's made the most peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but I can tell you one thing, we didn't go hungry. <laughs> and uh, I just keep me in mind and I'll come back and we'll tell you some good things. Thank you, Rudy. I miss you, babe. Thank well, you. All right, good. that's a great example of, of friendship yeah. through the years. So actually through that friendship and then all of uh, John's friends in the uh, West End, uh, I got to know many, many people. So when it came time for 1956, when uh, I actually did go to an integrated school, I was fortunate in that I knew many, many of the students who attended this uh, Richard Montgomery. Also, also I'd like to mention that uh, Mr. Kelly mentioned that he came to Lincoln High School. I attended Lincoln High School, and Mr. Kelly was my science teacher hmm. at Lincoln High School. He's okay. a pretty good teacher. <laughs> That's a pretty nice statement. Good. Uh, good evening. My name is Gloria Poole. And I'm the class of 56 of Richard Montgomery High School. And I've been around Rockville over 75 years, so I know a lot of people. And I lived in West End along with Rudy and Johnny. 
we had a good, good relationship. We got to go over to the Bullard's Pond to swim when the patients weren't there, and that was fun. <laughs> uh, but um, I, what I know most of living in Rockville, uh, my family, we had uh, Jean's Florist, and we were in Old Rockville on Commerce Lane. Uh, we, of course, dealt with the black churches, the black people. We were friends to all. So I kind of think um, I had a, a step forward into knowing more people. Now, as I recall, back in the 50s, uh, the black people, they didn't go in restaurants, they didn't go in, in uh, restrooms. Uh, across the street from our flower shop was a place called, I don't know what it was called then, Deedles. Mm -hmm. If they wanted to order some food, they had to go down a little alley where there was a window, and the people served them through that window, whether it was hot food, cold food, beer, wine, whatever. I found out later, talking to Elaine, Crutchfield's sister, um, the people at the restaurant weren't very nice. If they ordered a beer and wanted to break it open before they started down their uh, street to Cairo Street, the guys in there had shaken it up. So when they removed the cap, they lost half of it. I thought that was, wasn't very nice, but you know, I never knew. You, you find out a lot of things in life that uh, gives you a real eye opener. Um, at the flower shop, we got the, the pie um, for a Palm Sunday. My dear mother knew how many palms Mount Calvary would get, or Jerusalem, or Mount Zion, even the little one up on 28. Uh, and, you know, she handpicked them all. But, but that, that was part of life that I was accustomed to that a lot were not. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I loved truly. Now, at Richard Montgomery, uh, I was out of school before my fellow mm -hmm. black students mm -hmm. came in, mm -hmm. but I came across a lot of the uh, players at Richard Montgomery because I did the Richard Montgomery 100 Centennial, and then they have a Hall of Fame there, so I got to know all the guys that got into the Hall of Fame, and uh, the two guys working on a committee, they couldn't find people, so they gave me the list, and I found a lot of them. It was a joy to see Ricky Summerauer come back in his nice <laughs> leather jacket and meet on the uh, a patio of the uh, cafeteria. Those guys were just awesome. Excellent. Good. Thank they, you. They, they were great, and it was so nice because that was our Saturday afternoon. We all mm -hmm. would go mm -hmm. to nothing to do. Everybody went to Richard Montgomery High School to in the sixties to watch the players. And they Good. were they were great. We had the coach Roy Lester out there. We'll get more into the athletics too as we continue. Thank you. That was great. I can go I just go on and on. No, no, I know. <laughs> I gave you a few few extra seconds that they'll make up for later. <laughs> yeah. My name's Bessie Hill Corbin. <clears throat> I'm from Rockville. I've lived in Rockville most of my life. And I've heard the name Connie Morella from my brother. <laughs> and this is the first, well, I think we did meet, but you came several times to programs that had a uh, Lincoln to the uh, Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. And yeah. Uh, Walker talked about Connie Morella, oh, good to meet you. She's saying that because she's a poster child, 
If you saw any of those posters, they have a picture of her. Mm -hmm. hold, one, hold one up. You have it in your oh. uh, envelope. They're going to try to get, pick, yeah, get, uh, get copies they... for everybody. But uh, continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to well, uh, point out. The early part see, of us yeah. who went to uh, Carver, and uh, I happen to be in that group. But uh, I, in 50, early 50s, oh, I'm sorry. I'm used to talking loud and everybody can hear me, so I forget about this. Um, uh, I was transferred to Montgomery Blair in the early 50s, right after the integration. And um, that was quite a large school, but fortunately for me, I had no problems at uh, Montgomery Blair. If there were any, I didn't know about it. So I'll, I'll put it like that. But that was quite a large school from what I had transferred from mm -hmm. um, Carver High School. <clears throat> But I remember when the, all of the meetings, um, 9 o'clock and everybody else, and a Mrs. Mason from Scotland, uh, trying to get the schools it integrated. And I, we always thought in the black community that um, Carver was the result of the Board of mm -hmm. Education and those concerned who did not want integration and Carver was built to replace uh, integration, but it didn't work for a while. So um, it was pretty complete. Mm -hmm. Seldom a lot of the schools that were built didn't have this, didn't have that, and didn't have the other. Carver was fairly well complete, which meant we did have the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I did go to the Rockville School, and I think I saw a picture of that old building up there, and I must say, uh, that was the only school that blacks had that had um, inside plumbing. <laughs> and that was an accomplishment. All the rest mm -hmm. were outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very and good. Uh, I was always afraid. I know when I substituted, when I went to school and came back to sub, the children, the teachers would let two go at a time because they were afraid they might fall in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in well, the that's toilet. terrific. That's great. Thank you. The reason I pointed out the poster is I just thought they should all have a look at, at the, uh, the young Bessie uh, because she's as beautiful as the current Bessie. I don't know, what am I doing here? You saw her on that video that I've been around early. I was newly married. I was in my early 20s. I wanted to get a job teaching. I contacted the Board of Education in August, and they said, yes, we have something for you in September. It's at Poolsville Junior Senior High School. So not knowing much about the record, I knew it was a rural community. At that time, I lived in Silver Spring, later lived in Rockville, and so I took on the job. What I did is I taught the ninth grade civics, I taught 11th grade English. I taught 12th grade English. I had the school cheerleaders, and I also had the school newspaper. It was called the Observer. Why did that happen? It's because the school was so small, the teachers did everything. I would drive from Silver Spring with a man, Harold St. Aubin, who taught math, who taught science, who taught, um, I don't know, astronomy or something like that. But he also had a portfolio with multi different classes. Junior, uh, junior and senior high schools were pretty much together. And then the elementary school was right next door. So I came from Massachusetts originally. I had no problem with integration, of course. Uh, but then I viewed the buses that were taking the elementary school kids right next to us and the children were crying and the parents were there. They did not want them to go into the school. Even though they were on the buses, they got off the buses. The kids wanted to go to school. In the junior, senior high school, it was the students who protested uh, because they felt that they should not be in school with blacks. There were signs, protest signs, um, signs that said, integration is communist. 
uh, uh, integration um, uh, is, uh, is a threat to us. Illegal, illegal was another term that was used. And so this was pretty uh, unusual to me, it was bizarre. There were very few black students. They were very passive. I mean, they were very polite. They wanted to do whatever had to be done so that they could get along and not cause any ripples. I remember one was Lorraine Naylor. I don't know whether she's still alive or not was a student, a special student of mine. Howard Lyles was in athletics, and I guess you guys will talk he's, about, yeah. is that right? He's one of my teachers. It's, isn't that amazing? And yet, it was through athletics that you could actually bring people together, like, yay, Redskins, yay, you know. Athletics seems to uh, be a, a mechanism that tends to do that. So I was surprised, I want to, pose questions for the others, but I just wanted you to get a little bit of my, my background. I do, yes, I did get some threats. I do remember that Lorraine's mother wrote me a letter that she gave me, and it said, Dear Mrs. Morella, please do not get yourself into trouble because of my daughter. And because I, I never did get into any real trouble, but it was very sweet of her to do that. And um, I just found that the black community were very gracious. One final story. A young woman whose father was a minister, uh, could give you her name too, and she came weeping to me. She was white, came weeping to me, and I said, why? She said, I want to be in your journalism class, which was actually an extracurricular activity. I want to be in the journalism class, but, uh, but my parents won't let me be in a class with a black. And so I had a black student there, and her father was a minister. The concept was and I saw this in papers they wrote, too, that the Bible says there should not be integration. Somehow they would distort factors from the Bible. So I simply said to her, we'll just not let them know. And everything worked out fine. Uh, Poolsville is now a pillar of the community, as you know. Uh, it's done so much, that rural farm community where everybody knew everybody else was the one that, that, that had the biggest, I think, um, challenge that it faced, and I think it was because of the community itself spread out such as it was. The telephone lines, remember that was when you had the telephone lines, you could hear, yeah, right, right, so that people might have a house a half a mile from each other, but they knew what was going on, they knew everything in the community, and that happened. So I'm honored to be here, I'm honored to say that that is past, past, but it's important we look at the past in terms of the future. And I am a little concerned about some of recurrences that have occurred that demonstrate we still have a way to go and much to remember. So now, enough about me. Um, I want now to pose some questions, and I'm going to ask them to just raise their hand as they want to answer it. Uh, and I think I'm going to start off with, what, what were your greatest anxieties or um, what, what did you expect, your expectations versus the reality in terms of being in a situation where you have the uh, blacks and whites working together for the first time? Anybody want to comment on that? Expectations versus reality, good, bad, and maybe what you learned from it. Boy, my expectations, I, I grew up in a, a Emmer Grove, where Mr. Kelly also yeah. lived. It was a very unique town, and we had our uh, we had two clubs. We had an African American uh, doctor. We had uh, our own theater. Uh, we had a store, bakery. Um, it was a, it was self sufficient. At church, you didn't have to leave Emmer Grove for anything. So coming from that kind of background and being and going into integration. It was a little difficult. I think the thing that I remember most was uh, right about that same time they were integrating uh, uh, Little Rock Central High School in um, in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and it was on the t on the news every single night, every single mm -hmm. night. So we kind of thought that that's what we were gonna we were coming into. Now I was in the I went to sixth grade at uh, Longview, which was uh, all African American. I only got to be at Carver for one year. So my expectations after seeing what was going on in the news and what, what, what was going to happen 
we were very anxious. But I think that they did a great job coming to Carver and preparing us and telling us what to expect. Uh, and they, went, they did the same thing at, at Gaithersburg. So once we got there, I, uh, it, it, we really kind of kind of rested, settled down. Everything was, was pretty good. I, one of the things that I remember in the eighth grade, only went there for, uh, to Gaithersburg Middle School for one year. After that year, ninth grade went to uh, the high school. So you know, there were things along the way, there were fights, but people weren't really afraid. I think most of the people just realized, hey, that this is what it is, and uh, we got together, even though the expectations were somewhat different mm -hmm. from Carver to, um, to Gaithersburg Middle School. Mm -hmm. In terms of you, you were expected, at Carver you expected to be successful. You were expected to go to college. Mm -hmm. Once I went to uh, integrated schools, that expectation left and it was kind of understood that you would do a trade uh, as opposed to um, uh, being a professional. That's, that's very interesting. Anybody else want to comment on that? Or, yes. Okay. Well, great. I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, and then you'll be next. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to mention that my expectation was, as, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in uh, West Rockville, so I had lots of friends who were already at Richard Montgomery. I transferred in the 12th grade from uh, Richard Montgomery. <clears throat> and during the summer, one of my friends, white friends uh, in West Rockville, he became aware that I would be attending the school. So he says, well, um, when school opens, I'll come to your house and we'll walk to school together. So that uh, was, I, you know, I enjoyed that. That was very uh, helpful to me. And so we did walk and we, we didn't ride the bus because we weren't eligible to ride the hmm. school bus. And we walked from West uh, Rockville to uh, Richard Montgomery. Wow. And then as soon as I got in the front door, another friend uh, I ran into uh, right inside the front door. And he says, well, he says, you know, your homeroom is going to be down the hall this way. Uh, I'm going to be in that home run, so come on down with me. So we walked there. And that made it a lot easier than when I got in the room, another friend uh, who was sitting right beside me. He was uh, reassuring me that not to worry about anything. Hmm. So, I, you know, I didn't. Then my first class, I went to my first class and I went in and there was another friend who I sat beside uh, in that class. So it was very, very positive. All my classes, I knew people in those classes. So my expe expectation was almost like business as usual. And I really mm. didn't have any uh, any special anxiety about that first day or even that first period of time. So I think my, my situation may be a little bit uh, s ex different stemming from the fact that I knew so many people at Richard Montgomery before I attended. It made it a lot easier when you had that social integration you know, for the first 15, 16 years of my life, uh, starting with uh, John Moeller, which I appreciate very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, oh, good. We got two mics. Good. Uh, I want to tell you about my expectation. Okay. Well, the first thing, I was an elementary school teacher, and that's where they put me. But the thing, I'm not going to expound on it. But you got to remember, I grew up with James Brown, Temptation, and I had to teach square dancing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to get a recorder. Mm -hmm. I had to get a book. I didn't know any, nothing taught me about square dancing in my education. <laughs> but I had to do that. And I, th I thought that was funny, but I had a ball. And I think that... Uh, Teachers were very, very accommodating. Now, the next thing, I went to high school, and, and I have to tell you this, I was trying to go to high school. And so the playgrounds in Rockville were segregated. I had Lincoln Park, hmm. and a young man named Eugene Doan had Twinbrook. We had to play for the city championship in basketball. So we played, and I knew nothing about basketball, 
but I had the guys, and we won. Hmm. And he's come over to congratulate me, and he said, and this is very important, you never know who's watching you. Hmm. And he said, I like the way you handle those kids. And he said, I want you to come to Sherwood High School. I am the department chairman, and I want you to come, and I'm, I want you to be the, my assistant basketball coach, and I want you to be the head uh, track coach. I don't want to do anything with track. I don't know nothing about track. I understand that you do. So he brought me on as uh, his assistant in basketball, then I was the head uh, track coach, and then I got cross country. All right? So now I'm assistant basketball coach, head track coach, head cross country coach. Now, the thing that happened was I had too many stipends. After a while, they start paying people. So I had to go to the principal, and he said, well, nobody's going to take these, and you'll keep them. And then he came back because of pressure from the community. And you have to remember, basketball, football, and baseball, high profile, high profile sports. And he said, well, you know, so and so and so, so you're going to have to give up basketball. So I had to give up bas boys basketball. But I went to girls basketball sometime later. And my first team was 25 and 1. And they said, why'd you leave? <laughs> OK. But some of the things that you don't know being the first, I could go to, I'm going to the play, play a game, basketball. And I knew everybody in, in the school because all the boys, we grew up together. So I'm going in to coach the team. And uh, I get to the door, and they said, that would be $5. <laughs> I said, for what? Are you going into the game? I said, yes. I wasn't belligerent. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> she said, I'm the coach of the team. Well, I had white assistants. They have gone in, and they are the coaches. I said, no, no. They are my assistant, and I'm the <laughs> head coach. <laughs> and so that was something that uh, I had to do. And now track and field. One thing, one thing you have to just remember, as a and, I, and I, I'll use the word black because that's what in my era. I'm a black coach, and I'm coaching at a high school. They expected certain things for my teams were negative when they came in, when we came in, but it didn't happen. The first thing we taught was character. Character counts. Mm -hmm. And one time we were at a basketball game, and my kids came in, and they came in, and they sat together, and, and they opened the books. And some person came up to me, said, Quattro, why do your kids? I told them, because they're smart. That's what they, that's what they wanted to do. And in track, you had, you had to be better. And, and people just don't, if you come across a line, and it's like that, you don't win. Mm. You don't win. Mm. You got to come across a line, and you up there, and the other people are, are back are back there. The last thing I want to tell you about my experience: we are playing in a state championship team at Catonsville, Maryland, and this is the first time it ever happened. We are winning. My team is winning. Boop, time out. They go to the scoreboard, they go to the score table, and they said, Sherwood High School is not uh, up ahead by eight points. And what? Now we had the scoreboard right, we had the Washington Post right, we had the Montgomery County Center right, we had the Gazette right, we had the Baltimore Sun. Every, team, every uh, reporter had the same score. So they go to the score table, and she said, no, no, that's not right. What do you know? What do you mean it's not right? Sure, was not ahead. And, and do you know what they did? The first time they took 
In the state championship, they took the scores off the board, and we, and we lost the game by two points. Mm -hmm. Never happened again in the state history, and mm -hmm. I think that was mm -hmm. very important. And we just, but the only thing I thought, and I asked, I was girls, I said, "Do you want to play?" And they said, "Yeah, we want to play," because I was going to walk off the court. You know, that points out again what we alluded to earlier about sports being a, an element where you learn teamwork, yeah. cooperation, uh, hard work, and, it, and you know, the concept of friends. You mentioned the friends that you had. Uh, one of the other questions I was going to pose is, did you find it easy to make friends with people of a different color? And I think sports help. And incidentally, P.S., Boy, I, I appreciate Title IX for what it did to women's basketball. Yeah, yeah. I remember playing basketball. Yeah, I'm it was yes. horrendous. Yeah. Thank you for being patient. Well, thank you. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what uh, Mr. Crutchfield spoke about with character. As we all know, your true character is who you are when no one's watching. Mm. That is all about true character. Uh, I was so young when they integrated, like once again, I was in fourth grade, so as a kid, all you think about is going to school, playing, eating candy, being mischievous. And I was one of those mischievous children. Mm -hmm. But I, am, I was enthusiastic about going to a new school. Reason why, because I would travel a mile and a half as opposed to 10 plus miles. So that means, yes, I want to ride a shorter ride. So that's where my enthusiasm came when I transferred from Taylor Elementary School, which is in Boards, Maryland, going to Poosville. Um, no regrets because I was going into a new environment. So whenever something's new, you kind of, in a way, if you really look forward, you kind of interested in seeing where you're going in somewhere new. Uh, but no regrets from uh, transferring because I had wonderful teachers in Taylor and I had wonderful teachers at Poolsville Elementary School. So, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was very grateful mm -hmm. and I'm very to, grateful. Do you want to make a statement? Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you. When we talk about integration and schools, we can't overlook housing. Mm -hmm. Housing is a very significant part of that. And I worked with Alexander Green of Rockville Amen. for more than 15 years on the Housing Commission. And as an aside, there were other groups that I worked with, and I wanted to say that uh, Congressman Morella was always there <laughs> to help us and support Thank us. You. And so when we talk about the success of integration, and facing the problems and how they were dealt with behind the scenes. Her name wasn't in the headlines, but she was working on them. And we always knew that she was there for us. The check, is, the check is in the mail, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you can never rely on those deliveries. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. You know, I, I'm curious. Were, were you given enough and, and were other uh, youngsters given enough background from home and from their other educational situation to be able to step into some of the situations that you were in? Uh, I'm curious about what, what uh, parents should have done, didn't do, what colleagues did. Just give me the kind of characteristic, the personal characteristic of all of this integration bit. Uh, can't hear me, okay. Uh, about whether or not, whether there was a role for others that was not played adequately to prepare young people for going into school settings where you might have a black teacher with a white group, uh, you might have a white teacher with a black group, you might have a mixture with very few. I mean, at that time, Hispanics weren't really part of our role but where you might have very few who were black and very few that were white. How, was there some preparation that should have been done if you were to advise people now, any preparation for this new experience? 
Okay, who wants to comment on it? Okay, great. Okay. Now, now I'm going to limit your time. Okay, okay. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, one thing, as I think I had the best job in the world. And I think, and I always tell people, if you Harvard lawyer, a teacher has to teach you. Mm. If you're a mechanic, somebody has to teach you. Okay, so my job was to prepare the kids, to get to know the students. Now, that doesn't happen now. Visit their homes. Take them to church. Hmm. I asked them what's the most segregated church where I was. I said, we going. I brought them to the black church. I went to the homes, okay? And so I preached education. The boys were standing on the block. And that's the hallway. You don't know what a block is, but that's the hallway. <laughs> and I would walk up to them, and I would say, if you add two zeros together, they say, what? I said, what do you get? They said, you get zeros. I said, that's all you're going to be if you stand on that corner. Mm. Mm. And, and they move, and they're very successful. Very good. Girls, every girl that I had, on that basketball team, went to college, but won. 98% of them graduated. Hmm. So what I did, what I did, when they went to college, I brought them back. And I said this, I got out of the, the uh, gymnasium, I said, talk to them. Mm -hmm. And they said, you will not break the uh, the things that we have going for you going to college. Ideal. And then we'll get uh, to very you. Good. Um, and then I'll get to you. We, we, um, we, we grew in African American communities, and because it was a segregated society, all African Americans, whether you were from Poolsville, Sandy Spring, Rockville, Emory Group, you all knew one another. And uh, they said, I've heard, you've heard to say that it takes a village. And it did. When you, you know, the, when I was in elementary school, there were no behavior problems. There were no behavior problems mm. because your parents, even though they didn't have an education, their expectation was that you were going to do better than they were at mm. any, by any means necessary. And it didn't just go with your parents and your family. It was the community in general. So if they just heard that you misbehaved in school or you did something, you had to deal with the whole community as opposed to, to the parents. So they, the, their expectation was that you were going to get an education. They didn't have a chance to get one. I graduated, I have a couple of degrees with a master's degree. My dad was a sharecropper. He had third grade education. My mom was a, a, went to junior high school. But they were determined that I was going to do better by any means necessary. Fabulous. First, I want to say about this young man. He had started something at, uh, he won't say it, at uh, Julius West. It was called Brothers of the Stu Superstars. And he would bring all the kids in, and they would have lunch, and he would bring in various speakers to tell them about their accomplish accomplishments that they did. But it was him that started the Brothers of the superstars at Julius West High School. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that. I think another thing that's very helpful is Little League baseball, Little League flag football, and any other kind of activity. It doesn't necessarily have to, have to be in the school, but if you can get the kids playing together, they're going to get along uh, much better you know, 15, 20 years from, mm -hmm. from that point in time. You had a comment you wanted to make on that. Well, as a motivational speaker, my life is geared <laughs> to children. Here are my themes. My theme is education, reading, respect, believing in oneself, setting goals for oneself, perseverance, and last but not least, thinking of yourself as someone special. Mm -hmm. that's, that's terrific. Yeah. I'm from a large family. <coughs> Excuse me. And if they had a mother like I had, you didn't have to worry about pretty much anything, discipline and everything else, and everybody in the neighborhood knew her. 
That's true. I, 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 I shouldn't tell this tale out of school. My sweet mother, who's at post everlasting, but I had one brother who was a real rascal, and he would play hooky from school. And so my mother would go to school. You sp oh, no, I don't feel well. Well, he would go off then and would play with friends. So my mother, like you're suggesting, called the truant officer and said, come pick up my son. He is not going to school, and he's playing hooky. And that solved that. So uh, it, it, it is true. Pa parents now seem to feel that there should be some distance between discipline and achievements of their of their children. Maybe we should do something about that. Uh, anybody have any other comments on that? It, it's inter it's interesting when you talk about working together with regard to uh, uh, regard to sports. I would submit, if you agree with me, that it happens with other games too. I mean, for instance, Sandy Day O'Connor, that wonderful first woman on the Supreme Court feels that we need more civics education. And one of the things I did teach was civics. And because people don't really know, they, they, they agree with, uh, who was it, who used to have the jaywalking, Jay, Jay Leno would have the, the, Jay, the Jay man on the street. And so she has come up with games and they are called iCivics. Now when you get young people interested in games, even if they're not sports games, they are working together with something with which they're having fun. And that seems to be working that I civics. Do you agree with me? You're just a bunch of sports people, aren't you? <laughs> but it just seems to me when you can get groups together, uh, different groups, different backgrounds and all, and they can have something in common where they are working together, then they learn to share. Congress could do that, huh? Well, at any rate. Yes. Just, just, just to get back to what you were talking about with, with, with sports in general, and that led to so many other things. When we went to Gaithersburg High School, um, it was a very easy, well, it was an easy transition. There was a guy named uh, Jackie Holland, and he was a running back, a great running back. And the, the football was segregated you, back then, but once schools were integrated, then the, that's what happened. But I remember one, one uh, evening, uh, and it was always night football in Gatesburg. This guy named Jackie Holland, we were playing against, they were playing against, I was much younger, they were playing against Northwood High School. And he took a handoff and went 65 yards off tackle. Now, African Americans would kind of be on one side of the stadium and uh, white Americans would be on the other side. That touchdown that day, it was so important because the crowd started to jump up. Whether you were black or white, you just look for the next person as closest to you mm -hmm. to give hug or, or, or to yeah. shake their hands. Back then, they didn't give fives, but to shake their hands. So between the, him, that guy, and a guy named Jim Ward, who later became a, um, a professional quarterback, they kind of set the standard through athletics. To, uh, to, and they set a model by which uh, the school would, would would go from that that point on, and the civic spot. You know, once you get that part done, once you, the, the athletics were there, once you could root for one another and play with one another and appreciate one another as individuals, regardless of color, it kind of changed the way you taught. You know, you learned how, the way you shared, and the, the integration in, in schools in general in every part. Was integration different for females than it was for males? Were there differences? Would our women like to comment? Were there differences in integration, how females reacted versus how males reacted? Well, being a young man, listening to the stories that were happening yeah. to, like George Barnes, who I know very, very well, uh, my cousin, Curl Wims, he would tell me that when they first went into Poozer High School, they had officers when they got off the bus. I heard stories from guys being run out of Poozer. If they missed their bus and had to walk home, they were run out of Poozer. I didn't hear anything about the young ladies ever being aggravated and being attacked the way the young men were. Mm -hmm. okay. From my and experience. That's, that's very interesting. Anybody want to comment on that or disagree on that? I don't think uh, at that time, 
I don't think women were pushed to be athletic. Because mm -hmm. I was an athlete, and then you get all kinds of names. But um, eventually, I think uh, women, and now they are as active as the men are, and they're in just about everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. back when, uh, women weren't encouraged, or girls weren't encouraged to be too rough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right, there was that kind of that cultural concept of the woman doesn't rock the boat. Sometimes she doesn't get what the guy gets because he's the athlete in there, you know, getting hugged when he uh, has the winning touchdown. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it is and interesting and it is, it is different. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I, see, I've always felt that coaches, football, athletic heroes, are some of the best role models for young people. You can take a CEO of a big company, and do you think these kids care about that CEO who comes on with a public service announcement saying, don't do this or do that? But if you get a coach or a hero in, in one of the uh, athletics, then, then this is what the young people look at. This is what they care about. And now we're getting women into that same role too. Uh, mm -hmm. Women's programs and men's programs, uh, they were char charging at, you know, to do it. But then uh, I remember when <clears throat> I had uh, girls' teams, and uh, you had men and women, I mean, the young people going uh, two teams, the male and the female. But uh, when they started charging, women didn't have mm -hmm. uh, teams where they came to see just the women. But if they were double, they got two for one. But um, it, they weren't, uh, women participation in sports wasn't as... Uh, Accepted. Pushed, like, right, uh, right, you know, right. Uh, in one of our first uh, Olympics, uh, mm -hmm. I think about 1927, there was only one sport women could participate in. What do you think that was? Ice skating, ice skating. Now, if you look at the last Olympics and you look at who came away with all the honors, these are the women's teams. So it did show a great change. Well, I want to really open it up to, to, uh, uh, to the audience. But before I do that, uh, any one of you want to make some comment before we open it up to everybody else? Can I say one thing? Yes, of course. Do you want to make a comment? Oh, uh, I, I will let her say one thing, and then you can say two things. I'll right. say it fast. <laughs> so all you guys over there, the yeah. jocks, the jocks, do you feel uh, uh, that sports in Montgomery County became very, very good when you combined the blacks and the whites? Yep. That's an easy answer. Read the know. stats. <laughs> I just, I would have to agree. I would have to agree. It, it has gotten better. It has gotten better. Mm -hmm. Same here. <laughs> yeah, you have to agree that, uh, you know, things come and speed. I would always tell speed kills. If you got some speed, you're going to be pretty good. <laughs> I, just, I, I guess an example would be in 1947 when uh, Jackie Robinson uh, broke the color barrier. Mm. Before that, there was, of course, the Negro League, and then there was the regular American uh, uh, and, and National League. But once they combined and everybody got an opportunity to participate, I think things get better then, when everyone gets an opportunity mm -hmm. partic to participate and work together. Mm -hmm. And the buddies. Well, that's what I was going to pig, pig, pig it back on. Yeah. One of the things we haven't said very much about is the academics. Right, okay. Uh, the, we had some extremely bright black kids, but in an integrated situation where you're dealing with cause and effect in science, because they haven't had the experiences that would have enabled them 
to perform on par with other students in that school. They were at a handicap for a period of time, but I think we eventually got over that. But that was one of the situations mm -hmm. that existed in the early uh, period of integration. And, and now you still may see it in terms of uh, lack of equity in certain areas, too, where the kids don't have computers and have to go to the library for it and that kind of thing. But, but you're right, that has been changing, thank goodness. Okay. I think, uh, one other thing was when uh, we had Mr. Gibbs. I don't know if I'm ahead of the program. Mr. Gibbs taught me. Mr. Gibbs was a gentleman who had the salary equal. And mm -hmm. of course, he lost his job because of that. It was all right for him to teach uh, until he started the uh, case. And he had uh, Mr. Houston and um, what was he, Sharon? Thurgood Marshall. Oh, Thurgood Marshall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. I remember uh, when they came to the school several times to speak to them. Uh, we didn't get well. We met them once, and um, they, he had started the equal pay for the teachers, black and white. Mm -hmm. Anybody mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. in there. But the following year, he didn't have a job. He was a tremendous person. He was a jack of all trades. Um, he was inspiring. And he had to teach two rows of over here of one grade and another two and another, whatever it was, divide them up equally. And he had two or three classes in one room. And he had to teach uh, under those conditions. It's real, he real was commitment. A tremendous there person. are probably a number of other kind of unsung heroes who were so committed to education that they just went beyond what everybody expected, and and unfortunately had sort of I a think he got to know everybody reputational demise. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. OECD, where I served in Paris, that was a hardship zone. I did it for our country to be in Paris, but. Um, they do a, a rating called the PISA score of what 15-year-olds do in schools in 70 countries. Very intensive. The United States puts the greatest amount into our educational system, and yet we rank about 15th. Who ranks high? Um, Shanghai, not all of China, but Shanghai, South Korea, Finland, um, it, Sweden, those are the countries that rank high. There have been some questions about, well, what are you doing? Why is it the difference you're making? Even Taiwan is one of them. And when you come down to it, it's that they give recognition to their teachers. To be a teacher in those countries is a high profession. You have opportunities for various exchanges, professional meetings, but you are admired as somebody who is in the really high profession. And I think if we did more of that in our country as one of the takeaways, that you would find what happens in the classroom would be kind of like what you're suggesting uh, that uh, Mr. Gibbs did, uh, that there would be a real, co and what you've done, a real commitment to these kids. I, I just want to say this, and this is my last comment. We had to go to uh, elementary school half a day. Nobody mm. knew that in Rockville. Mm. Wow. One half a day. One come in one section, the other one comes in the other section. Wow. That is a... That does open it up to your questions. Uh, I, I think the panel has done a great job. We'll applaud them later, but let's ask you if you have any questions or comments that you would like to make or something we did not address. There are so many things one could talk about when it comes to our history. Uh, surely you have some questions. I could ask you what brought you here. <laughs> oh, I know. That's right. Exactly. You never...
No, not Spinning Claw. I know. Uh, but, but give us your name also. Sure. You, uh, my name is Jennifer Hester, and I'm actually the daughter of Rudy Baker, who is um, sitting up there in the panel. Uh -huh. And this, for me, has just been a great experience because I also have lived in Montgomery County for all of my life. Um, and as I kind of look around the room, I see that there is a generational um, difference in terms mm -hmm. of who the majority yeah. is here. And that worries me. You know, I think that there is a lot of information to be learned um, and to be had that does get lost over generations. And part of me, though, is also very thankful for that. I mean, I grew up in the same, actually, in the house that my dad did. Yeah. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be raising a family right next door. And so I was the high school class of 89, Richard Montgomery. Uh -huh. And my kids, um, if they go to the same high schools, which they would, would be the class of 2022 and 2026. Mm -hmm. And their experience is very different from my experience um, in Montgomery County Schools, very different than my father's experience in Montgomery County Schools. And part of me feels very blessed about that. The challenges that I had, I remember growing up, was more about you're a girl, mm -hmm. you can do anything, you know. It was different. Every generation yeah, yeah. has its challenges. I think my daughter would look at me if I said that, and she'd be like, well, of course I'm a girl. I can do anything. I mean, you're, you're crazy. But what would, you, what would you tell my kids in terms of the things that they should take away and that they should know? Because they're not going to understand my experience as, you know, I would say that, you know, I looked at my dad and said, you're crazy, why are you telling me these things? Of course, you know, and, and that's good, but what would you, what, what would you leave with them so that they can appreciate, take from it your experiences and then use that to address the challenges of their generation and um, use the past to improve the future? That's an excellent question, and they're gonna answer it. And, and I think I'll let every one of them have, again, 15 seconds. Uh, uh, good luck. That, that, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, um, he was talking about the Brotherhood of Super, Superstars, mm -hmm. the group we have at Julius West. I think Ms. Moon uh, started it now. Mrs. Uh, Green, uh, myself still work there. But um, un unless it's difficult to see the future, if you don't know the past, one of the things I tell the, uh, a bunch of the young guys and my students in general, is you know you come in and you sometimes you don't take education serious and you 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 just not you know keeping up, and I'll tell them you know somebody died so that you could have an opportunity to read, somebody wow. died so that you could sit in in the, at that desk, um, and just it's a, a, it's so very serious. But unless you, unless we pass this on, unless they know that, they in a lot of cases don't take education that serious. So it's just very important to let them know what we had to go through to get an education. You know, uh, to, to be to to have African American teachers to be to get the equal pay to go to school. Just real quick, I went to, to I went to I was in Emory Grove. We caught the bus, the person who drove the bus lived in Emory Grove also. So we caught the bus at six o'clock in the morning and we went from Emory Grove up to the Germantown, to Clarksburg and to Damascus. So I caught the bus at six o'clock and we got back home around four because it was only one high school and it, which was Carver. On a bad, on a day when a bus broke down, we not only had to do that, we had to go to Olney and Sandy Spring. As many kids as you could pile on a bus were on that bus. And, you know, when it was heat in the summertime, it, I mean, in the, in the spring, it was really bad. Well, now you could just get on the bus and you go straight to where you're going. But you have to share those stories, as you said, so that they'll understand that uh, education didn't, it didn't just c come to us. It was something we had mm -hmm. worked for march for, struggle for, and die for, and that should make a difference with uh, students. And that's an excellent answer, too. I, 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 I think, um, I'm just saying what I did. Uh, I took it personally. I, I brought the, the kids, the students, I should say, with me to different places. Put them in a car, take them, 
and we're going to go so and so places. And, and then again, it's important that you tell them about the past. Now, they have no idea. I had a group of my athletes sit them down, and I said, who is Jesse Jackson? And you know what they told me? They said, oh, he was in the Olympics, you know, and they thought it was Jesse Owens. Mm -hmm. It was Jesse Jackson. So they didn't know. No. So I think one thing in the education policy, we have to teach. We have to teach about the past of the Afro-American black Negro uh, struggle to get to where we are right now. That's why I'm pleased that there are long lines for the African American Museum. I saw Ralph Bunch recently and told him that. Yeah, it's fab fabulous. Well, the one thing that we have to continue reinforcing with our youth today is the importance of education. I'm sitting here now, not because of my basketball ability, but because of my education. And whenever I talk to kids, I let them know when I'm standing in front of you, it's because my mother and my father, they were smart enough to send me to school. Every day I was in school, I had teachers. They were smart enough to teach me. So because of education, that's why I'm successful. And I'm very fortunate. I was the first one in my family to graduate. I graduated from Geneva College. I have a degree in psychology. I have two daughters who have graduated. My youngest daughter now just graduated with her master's degree, but I was telling Crutch that she had to pass a test to be certified to be a social worker. She had to take this test four times. It's really strange. Every time she took this test, her test had to be a higher score. First time she took it, she got something like an 88. They said she had to have a 90. The second time she took the test, she got a 92. They said she had to have a 93. Oh. The last time she took the test, she got a 96. For some reason, she could have had, had to have a 96. So make a long story short she kept driving and driving mm -hmm. and driving because she didn't want to waste all that time getting her master's not to pass a social work mm -hmm. exam but it's really strange that every time her number came up she always had to get a higher score mm -hmm. now she now she can look to the fact that the uh, the new dean of the american university washington college of law is a black woman and the new Librarian of Congress is a black woman who came from Folger Pratt. So they need to have role models, but they need to know the history. So I, I said each of you are going to say something about. Uh, uh, no, you're going to pass. Okay. okay, then we're ready for another question. After uh, integration, what happened to the former black schools like Carver, did they remain open as neighborhood schools or were they shut down? I understand that most of them were kind of substandard. Okay. Uh, Carver High School was not substandard. It was standard. Uh, they had, it was also, if you don't know, it was the first uh, junior college. And uh, they taught uh, dry cleaning, they taught um, cosmetology, they taught auto mechanics, and, taught, and this is a brand new school. Now, I've always said they took the black, school, the black students out of Carver High School and took them and, and transferred them to Richard Montgomery. Now, if you got to remember, Carver High School is a state-of-the-art high school. We had Plenty of land around. Montgomery College had to expand. You had the um, college, um, with the townhouses went there. The rock terrace and everything wasn't there. Why didn't they take the white students and put them in Carver High School? Mm. They didn't do that. You know why? Because the white parents didn't want their kids coming to a black high school. Mm. 
Wow. Time. We have another one. Three, four years ago, I worked with Eileen McGuckin and um, <clears throat> went through the process. They had the hearing and everything. And it is now um, historic. They can't tear it down. There are only certain things that they can do to it. Mm -hmm. But it serves as the Board of Education. I call it headquarters. Mm -hmm. And they are still in there. But it can never be torn down. It's still, and it has to keep the same name. I don't know about the OK, other guys, over there, I'll get you one more time. Um, I found out when I went up to the Carver celebration a couple weeks ago. Sure, Richard Montgomery had a fancy auto shop and this and that and the other thing. I found out that Carver had auto shop, cosmetology. You know, I had no way of knowing that. So you were keeping right up with us but in your own little way because you had instructors that came in there and stepped forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now the cars at Richard Montgomery's auto shop went much faster. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, there were four uh, elementary schools that had been consolidated. Only one of them was kept as an elementary school. The others were either special school or special use. Uh, uh, Carver was not used as a high school, nor was Lincoln. Carver was turned into a uh, board of education and yeah, for Lincoln for other uses. The uh, the interesting part of that, too, is neither of the black principals of Carver or Lincoln were assigned to an integrated school as a principal. They were uh, as a assistant principal or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Interesting history. Any other comments? Yes, I have two here. One, two. Okay. Thank you. It would be really nice if we could have. And and what's your name again? Patrice. Yeah. Thank you, Patrice. Um, it would be really nice if we could have your panelists visit some of the schools today, because mm -hmm. um, as diverse as some of them are, I don't want to call any names, but as diverse as some of them are, a lot of the diversity comes from people who are not from this country. And they come with the stereotypes that they saw or their parents saw 40, 50 years ago. Um, and their attitude is the same as it was back then. Oh, you mean the teachers? No, the oh. students. Oh, the students, the, okay. The students mm -hmm. have that attitude. They have adopted that uh -huh. attitude towards each other. Very competitive. They don't talk to each other, you know, call names and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm not sure if we could have your, our panelists um, team up with the Minority Scholars Program or whichever program. I know some of the schools are very proactive about, you know, integration and making sure that everybody gets along. Do, do you but, have a uh, list of schools that they could visit? Because I'll ask Peerless Rockfield right to, the, <laughs> to assign the them to Montgomery a school. Is... Area. We can start right next door with Richard Montgomery since, you know, we all have um, a historic relationship with them anyway. But um, I know that the principal there is very proactive about, you know, seeing what the challenges are as far as the children getting along together well. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anyone has Anybody want to comment on that? It, it is a whole new kind of problem, yeah, yeah. a little similar to a little similar, yeah. but you know, but with many other differences. It's in interesting. I guess after, uh, th I'd only I'd retired th three years ago, and after being in the system for 33 years, um, y yes, you, you, you're correct. Uh, there are a lot of incredible things going on in the school system now for all students uh, uh, to push uh, Lat Latin American students, uh, African American students. There are tremendous programs going on now. One of the things I see, though, 
is in terms of achievement, in many cases, if you still look at African American achievement and the achievement of uh, you know uh, other minorities, it is still in many cases far below the level of achievement uh, of other students in Montgomery County. But there, uh, there is a big push on in Montgomery County Public Schools is just doing so much right now to bring that to a level playing field, I agree 100 percent. So you're pleased with what you see in terms of mm -hmm. the motivation and the actuality? Yeah. I, 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 I am pleased. Um, I'm seeing more and more uh, African American students in, uh, in AP courses. Um, in honors courses at one time, just a couple of years ago, that, that, that wasn't thought of. Um, there are uh, special programs where they, um, the studies that have been done and have been shared with all the staff. There's a lot more uh, camaraderie among staff in terms of educating kids, uh, educating all kids. And uh, so the kids belong to everyone, not just uh, a special education or, you know, whatever. But uh, I see a lot of, there's a lot to be done, a lot to be done, but um, there are a lot of programs that, which are going on right now to help uh, lift the, uh, the, the level of playing field. Uh, our county executive has really been on the ball with um, uh, being involved with all of the schools and the educational system in general, as well as so many others. So it is, we are starting to see an improvement, and I, I, I believe that uh, African American students in Montgomery County are h higher than those pretty much across the nation right now, even though there's a lot to be achieved, mm -hmm. uh, to be worked mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a goal we must not. Uh, I do that now in mostly in the elementary schools, but I also target the Title I schools with my program mm. because that's the need where they have reduced lunch, reduced okay. uh, other things. So my life is devoted right now to the Title I schools here in Montgomery County as other, other counties, Frederick County, Howard County. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I am a speaker for uh, the segregation in uh, Montgomery County Schools. And uh, I was just here at uh, Richard Montgomery, and I spoke to a, a group of youngsters and told them about just what you said about the past and uh, told them that things are changing. Things are changing. And you have to learn that you're in a different society than what I grew up with and then what Michael grew up with. I say you have to learn about other people. And you have to learn their ethnics. You have to learn about their ways of life. And that's what my, <coughs> my you know, talk was about. And they asked me many questions about what, you know, you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. So, it's coming. It's coming. Slowly but surely, it's coming. If I could just say real quick, after now I understand your question a little better. Absolutely, I would go anywhere, and I could bring a panel of students and people who grew up in you know a different society, like the one I did, um, to any school in Montgomery County. I would love to do that. So if once someone even wanted to take an initiative to set those things up, they will definitely happen. That's great to be able to call on to a group of people, too. I something about the too. school buses. Mm -hmm. In the days when my husband went to school here in Montgomery County, uh, my last name is Tally, Barbara Hill Tally. Tally. My husband, Herman, went to school in Lincoln High, which was the only black high school for, the only high school for black kids in Montgomery at that time. They had to pay $5 a month. They started at 3 and went to 5 because the Montgomery County government did not provide schools for black children. But the buses were provided to the children, well, for the children, by the parents. 
who had lawn parties and baseball games and competed with the churches. Different churches would compete and donate the money so that buses could be provided for black kids to get back and forth to that one high school in Lincoln Park where I grew up in Rockville, Maryland, and Montgomery County. At that time, uh, when he was in high school, I think he was number six out of 12 kids. There were 12 kids, and she had to pay $5 a month for each kid that was in school at that time. Mm. I walked to school because I lived in Lincoln High, I mean Lincoln Park. But paying for those buses took all of that coordination to have baseball games and other community affairs, so we know it really does take a village um, to get all these kids back and forth to school. And I don't know what year it was when Montgomery County government started uh, providing schools for black kids to get, get to that one school until school integration. And you also know, therefore, how, why it's important that young people now know about what their ancestors had to do absolutely. just to get absolutely. something as simple as uh, permission to, to go someplace. But it was know? just another wedge uh, between your mm -hmm. getting an education and being a full-fledged citizen of these United States, absolutely. one of many. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, forgive me, but I can see a comparison with feminism you know, I've asked young women, are, are you feminists? You know, I teach you a course on women in politics. And they say, no, no, no. Uh, but they don't understand that men are feminists, too, who just believe in equality. Now, some of you men may not agree, but just to believe in, e in equality for all. And uh, it, uh, it's something, I think, like when you have stereotypes, you know, cultural concepts of what one can do, what one should do. And I think blacks have been breaking through it, thank God. Women are now breaking through it too. And uh, it's just important for a great country that we have. You all have any comments you wanted to make in response to any of those questions? We, did we have another question here? I think, you, I think you're saying the time has come. Well, as you probably know, this is Education Week. So it's very significant that you're doing this on education and the difference it makes. And um, as a former English teacher, I can remember it was Addison back in the 18th century who, that said, a human soul without education is like marble in the quarry. None of its inherent beauties come out until the skill of the polisher takes it and makes it shine and brings out every ornamental vein and cloud that runs through it. I think you have had here polishers of the marble, people who have worked you know, throughout their lives and continue to for educating our young people to become great citizens. So let's give them a round of applause. I, I know I learned, I learned a lot from them. Wait till I ask them to speak someplace and they say, sorry, I can't. I, say, I remember we have on tape. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, too. Do you have any final comments? I just wanted to say thank you, Connie. That was a wonderful job. And to each and every one, another round of applause. Um, thank you all very, very much for what you've done here tonight. Uh, sharing your stories is so very important, and I do think that um, we've heard that echoed tonight. And um, we're really pleased that we've been able to offer this series. Um, we look forward to working with the community on other issues and other series and other educational programs to continue to tell these stories um, while we can. And um, I know the city is looking at diversity issues a lot now, so it could be that you know maybe more comes, comes of this. But um, thank you all for attending and offering questions and comments from the audience as well. And um, keep, keep in touch with us, and we'll see what other interesting programs we can bring forward in the future. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you.